Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's ninth meeting of 2019. Before we move to our first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones or put them on silent as they may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to decide whether to take agen agenda item five in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. And the second item on the agenda this morning is to take evidence in the Scottish Government's Wildlife Crime in Scotland 2017 annual report. And I'm delighted to welcome our guests this morning. We've got Sector Chief, uh, Chief Superintendent David McLaren, Specialist Crime Division of Police Scotland. Morning. Sayla Shaw, Head of Wildlife and Environmental Crime Unit. Morning. Uh, David Green, Deputy Head of Specialist Casework and Head of Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit. Morning. And Mike Flynn, Chief Superintendent of the Scottish Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Good morning. So, um, I'll get straight into it. Um, controversial subject, um, and it's uh, good news in that the wildlife crime reports of wildlife crime seems to be coming down. Um, so, can I ask just for your views on what you think, what you believe has contributed to this 11% reduction in wildlife crime um, since the, the last report? I mean, has there been a genuine de decrease or is it just a case of there have been less reports? How, how, can you, how can you figure that out? Yeah, I, I think that the, you know, when we look at percentage changes in such small numbers sometimes, uh, you know, Having any sort of um, assessment of what you know, what that the cause of that change is, can be uh, quite challenging at times. I think, um, I think there is uh, most certainly a much wider awareness of wildlife crime issues across the country. Um, certainly, a lot of the work that we do with partners um, highlights, you know, that, 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 that there is a real, I think, feeling across the country that um, you know, the, generally the public want to see a reduction in wildlife crime. Um, and, and you would hope that the work that we do in partnership around about raising awareness, prevention work, is having some effect. But I think that's probably the only thing I would throw a bit of caution around about that, is that the numbers are so small that any fluctuation is difficult to, to interpret in any great way. Have any other panel members got any thoughts on why we've seen that reduction? What's working? From our point of view, there has been a, a marked reduction in the amount of reports of illegal snaring. Um, compared to a, a good few years ago, those numbers have gone down. It still occurs, but it's, it's a lot less than it was previously. Right. Numbers are still quite high with birds, though, and, and I noticed. Um... Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I think the um, what I would say about the um, bird crime is that whilst that is quite a, a, a significant number, in terms of protected species, the numbers are quite low. So uh, whilst there are, I think it's in the region about 50 crimes against birds in general, the numbers in relation to uh, raptors being persecuted are, are, are quite low, and that's clearly one of the main areas of focus for us as part of the Raptor Persecution Delivery Group. Um, so whilst that does look like a large number, as I say, in terms of protected species, the number is still quite low. Okay. Um, I want to look at the, the statistics again. Are there any significant changes in how these numbers are being collated? Um, how you know, how stats are recorded around these. You say it's very small numbers. Has there been any change in the methodology at all since the last report? No, n not at all. Um, you know, y you may be aware we have different recording systems around the country, but we have a standard crime recording processes that we apply um, right across Scotland. So there's been no change around about that um, since the last reporting year. Um, as I say, the numbers are as they've been recorded in years gone by. You've highlighted some of the challenges already about um, presenting these statistics, very small numbers. I mean, are there any other challenges around how, how you present these statistics? I mean, for example, if you look at a, um, a reduction in wildlife crime, there could be a bit of complacency could, could, could creep in. Um, is it, it's important to highlight where maybe the numbers haven't decreased as well as you, you would like. I mean, there's an opportunity for you to maybe mention that here. You know, we've still got a lot a long way to go, I guess. We don't want any wildlife crime. No, absolutely, and, and I think it's probably worth highlighting. So these are the recorded crimes. There's still an awful lot of investigation goes in relation to suspected wildlife crimes that are reported to us. Um, so whilst you know 
these do look like fairly small numbers. Because of that awareness raising, I think that's, that we've been successful over the years in terms of raising the profile of wildlife crime. We do have a lot more cases that are reported to us as suspected wildlife crimes, a lot of work with our partners. Um, and in terms of that complacency, I would actually say we're going far the other way in that the um, work we do with, it, with our partners where we suspect a crime, um, you know, quite often, even in those early stages where we are absolutely certain whether a crime has been committed, mm. the level of investigation is such that should we get further down the line, for example, with a bird poisoning, we're content that we've captured the basics, if you like, at the early stages. And quite often that's happening in cases where there is no crime. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I guess you've, you've hit upon the fact that evidencing is, is, is complicated. Um, I wouldn't say complicated, just challenging because mm. of the, um, I suppose, the, 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 the nature of the crimes, I guess. Most um, occur in fairly rural <coughs> locations where there are um, very little in the way of witnesses. You know, if you look at, I guess, conventional crime investigation where nowadays CCTV, forensics, um, you know, telecoms, communications, data, you know, all mm. add to, to, to building a case. Whereas in a lot of wildlife crimes, that's a, you know, those opportunities don't exist. So quite often we're relying on those relationships that we have with landowners, land users in the areas where these crimes are commit committed. Um, and that's where that partnership working piece is really important so that we're able to make those connections so that when we do get a wildlife crime reported, it gives us the best opportunity to uh, realise opportunities. Okay, thank you. Right, my colleagues are going to dig a little deeper. Uh, John Scott. Thank you. Um, just to finish off that question, would you actually welcome the reduction, these reductions, um, which seem to me like good news, but hasn't necessarily been said that this is good news, not even implied. I, I think it's good news. Do you? Yeah, absolutely. I think any reduction in any type of crime is exactly, you know, prevention is at the key of what we're trying to do across the whole wildlife crime piece. Mm -hmm. So anything that's, that's uh, shown as a reduction, um, you know, is excellent. Uh, we, you would hope that we have some influence over that and that we've been successful around about reducing wildlife crime. But I, I take it back to the earlier point that you're always a bit wary of complacency around about this and, uh, you know, not necessarily high-fiving each other that there's been a reduction when we know that there is still wildlife crime going on and that there's, there's still a significant challenge there, particularly, as I say, in cases where um, it's difficult to establish whether or not a crime's actually occurred. We still have a lot of wildlife crime investigations ongoing. So, yeah, absolutely welcome it, but, um, yeah, certainly no complacency around about that. Before we move on to your uh, line of questioning, Finlay, you wanted to come in briefly. Thanks, Bring in, come in later regarding this particular species, and that's bats. has been the, 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 the bats champion for the, the parliament. But uh, I, I, you touched on um, the number of a crimes committed. Now, if we look uh, at the, 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 the wildlife uh, crime report, it doesn't necessarily give an accurate assessment of the crimes committed, but only uh, it reports on confirmed offences. So, for example, uh, there was a marked increase in the number of investigations into allegations of bat crime. I think it went up fourfold uh, uh, with 28 allegations of bat crime. However, there's no mention of bat crime at all in the wildlife report. So, can you explain why there's this discrepancy? In terms of the, a, a, a dedicated area within the report in relation to bat crime? Uh -huh. I, um, I could be wrong on this, but my, my understanding is that bat, bats come under the, the, the specific legislation for other um, wildlife types, but in relation to bats, that they come under um, a kind of general um, categorisation, if you like, so they'll be categorised generally rather than as a specific species. Although it's something that I'd be quite happy to take away and double, you know, double check that, but that's my understanding of that discrepancy. I think it's come up before in relation to bats. Uh, but I, I think there's, um, the, the report suggests there's no, even though it's in a separate, uh, you know, other wildlife crimes, it, it suggests that there's no uh, bat offences uh, However, there was 27 incidents reported. Yeah. So are we missing out on some data so we're not actually getting a true ref reflection? No, I think so. A, so an incident may be somebody coming to us to say they suspect a crime. So it's that uh, investigation that we carry out to establish whether or not a crime has occurred. And then, it, so that would be an incident in the first instance when it's reported to us. But actually getting to that threshold of where we can identify a crime has taken place for the reporting period, but we, we've not reached that threshold. So hence the discrepancy between the two numbers. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, convener, and I should declare an interest as a farmer, of course. Um, 
Can I ask you about the special constables? And last year you announced their introduction and essentially how has that worked out? And how have the special uh, the rural and wildlife crime special constables um, rules operated in practice? And is the pilot project ongoing? Yes, the pilot uh, project continues. We will be up to the full year um, at the start of April, so there's an evaluation will go on it towards the end of this month. Uh, there was a six-month evaluation um, that took place, uh, looking at the activity, the number of deployments of the special constables within the, the National Park, uh, you know, the number of deployments in partnership with the park rangers, um, and looking at the kind of work that they were getting involved in. Um, I think it's fair to say, and at the last Raptor Persecution uh, Delivery Group meeting, the, the uh, Cairngorm National Park lead was there, and, and the, the general feeling, and it, was, it came out of the um, initial evaluation is that whilst the special constables are de well you know, deployed within the park, that much of the activity that they undertake is more engagement work with uh, park users, uh, certainly working with or, or engaging with land owners, users in, in the National Park. In terms of actually being involved in wildlife crime investigation, um, it was fairly minimal, it has to be said. Um, so whilst I think the park, and, and uh, they, they'll obviously have their opportunity to feed into that evaluation um, at the end of the month, I think the feeling was that whilst it's a very positive thing for um, engaging with the community within the park, in terms of tackling wildlife crime, it was difficult to really see that there were any great benefits from it. Although the caveat to that I would say is that prevention is a really difficult thing to, to, to measure. Um, but as I say, we'll see, come the evaluation at the end of the month, we'll see where, where we go with that one. Uh, I mean, when the deployment of special constables was announced, it was announced as part of a package of measures to tackle primarily raptor persecution. Are you saying that these officers have not been successful in identifying areas where raptor persecution has been taking place? But well, uh, and I think not been useful in terms of bringing forward cases, evidence for cases that could then lead to prosecution. Well, well, I think it's important that we let the, the, the full evaluation take its course and we actually see what the, and what the impact on crime within the National Park um, has been over the last year. I think it's fair to say that actually before the deployment of the, the special constables in the park, uh, the numbers of wildlife crime within the park were actually, you know, weren't significant. Um, as I say, as part of that evaluation, we'll be looking at what intelligence has been gathered by the special constables whilst they've been deployed. Um, the engagement with different landowners, different land users within the park. Um, as I say, prevention is a really difficult thing to measure. Uh, you know, uh, I think what the, the measure of uh, be a comparison, I guess, between the last year and the deployments within the park and, and the years before that. Um, but you're absolutely right. That that is part of the special constable pr um, project. Uh, is part of a much wider. Police Scotland and partners response actually to, to raptor persecution all over Scotland, not just within the, the National Park. There are, that there are challenges brought about by the scale of the National Park. So this, given the time scales we had to deploy the special constables uh, to the park, most of them were already existing special constables who lived out with the park area. So to get them deployed, they have to you know, get from their home address into the park, get them teamed up with either a ranger or another special constable. And the park itself is, you know, not the most hospitable of places, it has to be said, for travelling around, particularly during the winter months. So, as I say, that, that I, I look forward to getting that, that evaluation to assess if there has, you know, what the success and what the challenges of the, the deployment has been over the last year. Okay. Do you have a, um, a, 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 a knowledge and understanding of what proportion of special constables' role is dedicated to wildlife crime compared to rural crime? Well, I, I, you, ballpark you, figures. well, I think, you know, if you're if you're investigating or you're, if your objective of, uh, to be in the, the the national park is to tackle, you know, wildlife crime, I think it's a given that any police officer or special constable also have wider responsibilities in terms of, you know, guard watching and patrol in that area. So I, I think it would be, you know, I don't I personally don't see the value in separating the two. You know, mm -hmm. these are police patrols in the area where we have both rural crime and wildlife crime. As I say, the figures around about the level of deployments we've had within the park will, will be made clear in the, the evaluation, but um, I think it's twofold, to be honest with you. And notwithstanding, and before the evaluation is complete, um, has Police Scotland formed any views on the success of the pilot and whether and how it could be rolled out in other areas or learned um, any other lessons that uh, you'd like to share with the committee? 
at this stage. I'm appreciating you will the, the proper evaluation will be presented in due course. Yeah, I, I, I think for me, I would rather wait and see what that evaluation is. Um, what will there be learning? I think absolutely. I think wherever we have a deployment for a specific crime prevention or crime enforcement purpose, and there's always learning with these types of initiatives um, that, be, that, that will be rolled out across the country. As I say, I think it, it would be folly of me to make any assessment until we get that evaluation, to be honest with you, and get a feeling for how successful the pilot's been. You're, you're positive about it, though, we hope. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. I, I think, you know, we, 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 we talk often um, ab about the challenges of wildlife crime. We're keen to look at different ways of doing our business to see you know what's successful, not you know what's not successful. You know, special constables, like all resources we have, are, are, are you know a finite resource that we need to make sure that we are putting them in the right places to to be, to be uh, effective. And I suppose in relation to wildlife crime, that's no different at all. And once we get that evaluation, we'll be able to assess that. Um, how much can be inferred from regional figures presented in the report? For example, the fact that the Highlands and Islands recorded the highest number of wildlife crime offences. To what extent do you think this is influenced by the distribution of, of resources, for example? Well, I mean, it's, it's the biggest geographical area in the country, so it figures that if, if you know, wildlife crime is occurring within rural locations, then the largest rural location we have in the country will have the highest figures. Um, in terms of deployment, you know, on, a, on a monthly basis, we look at the figures. We have wildlife crime um, officers within each of our divisions, and we make sure that you know, lays in with the National Wildlife Crime uh, Unit as well in terms of intelligence or analytical product that we're making sure we deploy our officers in the right places at the right times as much as possible. Thank you. And finally, with regard to resources, um, how is resourcing currently affecting the ability of Police Scotland and the SSPCA to investigate and prevent wildlife crime? What is the current resourcing picture beyond the pilot project? In relation to just the care, or we're we talking nationally? Nationally, I think. Yeah, yeah so, so, so we have, as I said there, dedicated officers within each of our divisions, but I think it's fair to say that, you know, an, an officer or a part-time officer within a division, you know, on their own isn't going to make, you know, a massive difference. I think to, uh, um, in a lot of respects, they are the kind of divisional experts, if you like, in terms of providing advice and guidance, support, etc., for investigations. But over the last year, we've run a number of courses where we're bringing in not just local community cops, as you might expect, but more specialist officers, so they have an understanding of wildlife crime, so that they may bring some of their skills to the investigations that we um, are undertaking. Um, particularly within our control room, there's a lot of training going on there to make sure that when call handlers are taking calls about potential wildlife crimes, they're able to identify really early where there might be opportunities uh, to, to make sure we get officers deployed as quick as we can and to actually identify, I guess, that there's a wildlife crime being reported to them or a potential crime being reported to them in the first instance. OK, thank you very much. Stuart Stevenson. Um, <clears throat> you said most of the special constables were redeployments from elsewhere. Did the initiative bring in new special constables because of their particular interests in uh, wildlife crime? Um, so so the, 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 um, the pilot started before I was in post, so the whole process around about how those um, special constables were identified, I, I, I'm uh, not completely okay with, but I can certainly double check that for you and get back to you. Uh, what I would say is that with countrywide, we are constantly looking to increase mm -hmm. our numbers mm -hmm. of, of, of special constables, a really valuable um, you know, resource for us. Um, and, and I think that um, through that engagement, actually, within the National Park, that's something that we've, we, we considered at the time, that actually having special constables within the National Park, engaging with people who are working or using the park, might encourage others to come forward and get involved in that. Um, again, it's part of that evaluation. It was something that we can perhaps cover to see whether or not there are been any from within the park. Um, I'm, I'm an enthusiast personally because I used to have staff who worked for me was, but in my previous life with special constables and uh, could see the value. Yeah. So I encourage you to see the opportunity of the special role that there is in this area. Okay, with regards to the pilot, is there any, Finn, you said you may have some questions, you're fine. Okay. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to you all. Could I um, turn the focus specifically to prosecution and sentencing? And um, some of this has been touched on already in terms of the difficulties of, of um, finding evidence, and we'll come to that as well later. But 
what would any of you see as the key challenges and barriers to achieving higher numbers of prosecutions for wildlife crime? Through the convener, I don't know who'd want to come to that first. Wildlife crime, I think David's already picked on it, that there's a lot more reported where you can identify a crime, but you cannot identify a, sub a suspect up to the statutory um, requirements required by the Crown Office. Um, so there is more, I know the statistics have gone down, but there are, are more offences committed. I mean, there's no badger offences listed uh, for the year that we're talking about, but there have been badgers involved, but it's not taken under the Badgers Act, it's under the Animal Health and Welfare Act because it's dogs that have been used, and it's been shown in evidence that the injuries were received from badgers. Um, so it, it's, it's the detection. Um, and just the very nature of wildlife crime, it's, it's, as David has already highlighted, it's not routine that's co normally caught on CCTV or done in front of plenty of witnesses. Thank you. And um, from yourself, uh, uh, Detective Chief, Superintendent, is there comments yeah, on yeah, that? Yeah, I, I think I covered it earlier on. It's, uh, it's reaching that threshold, and I think it's, it's worth saying that, you know, when we have significant investigations, we engage with Crown on a regular basis to make sure that, you know, it's not a case of us dropping a, a report on their desk to say this, you know, We've done as much as we can, kind of thing here. There's that constant dialogue to make sure that as we work through a case, we have an understanding of where that threshold might be. Um, but that is undoubtedly that is the challenge. It's the it's the um, the remote nature of most of these crimes um, makes it very difficult to, to to gather that that evidence. Right. And could I just highlight uh, specifically um, in relation to vicarious li liability, um, uh, the RSPB in their report illegal killing of birds of prey um, in Scotland, um, 2015 to 17, um, have said, and I quote, we've become aware in the spring of 2017 that a vicarious liability prosecution following the earlier conviction of a gamekeeper for killing a buzzard was being dropped after 14 previous court hearings as Crown Council considered it. It was not in the public interest to continue the case to trial. Could you make any comments on that? Perhaps pass some colleagues in Crown. Yeah. That, that was a, a particular case that, that Crown Council con considered um, be taking into account the facts and circumstances of that particular case. Mm -hmm. The Crown is under a duty to keep cases under review, uh, not uh, only to review evidence, not just when uh, a case is first reported to COPFS, but when, as a case is, uh, is, is ongoing as a prosecution. And in that particular case, uh, the evidence was reviewed by Crown Council in keeping with that duty, and uh, Crown Council decided that it was um, no longer in the public interest to, to continue with that prosecution. All right. Thank you. And um, the, the report, that report, um, sorry, your report also shows that only one wildlife crime conviction resulted in a custodial sentence. And could I seek views, please, on whether any of you think that the current sentencing is providing a sufficient deterrent to those engaged in wildlife crime in Scotland? I have to come in here and say that it would be quite inappropriate for the Crown Office to make any such comment. <coughs> sentencing is entirely a matter for the courts and, of course, for Parliament in uh, uh, setting uh, out the uh, levels that can be imposed by, by judges. Those are entirely matters out with our control, uh, and it would be inappropriate for us to comment. Right. Uh, I respect that, that, that comment. Thank you. And uh, could anybody else comment on the deterrent aspect of, of um, the, the levels of sentencing and the lack of custodial sentences? The gentleman next to me is entirely up to the court and it, under the individual circumstances, but publicly there is quite often an outcry that the sentences don't appear to be shown to be have any great deterrent um, factor. Anybody else? Are you able to comment yeah, at all? The same position as, uh, as David, that it's inappropriate for us to comment on, on sentencing. Um, I think what I would say anecdotally from, from individuals who are caught, they're well aware of the, the, the sentencing and the, the, um, you know, what follows at court if they're found guilty. So um, difficult to say whether or not it's a deterrent or not, and I guess it'll be on a case-by-case -case basis as well. Right, thank you. And could I also ask, um, does the Crown Office respond to the concerns mm -hmm. Um, that have been raised, um, uh, that they're not sufficiently transparent in communicating the rationale for their decision-making wildlife crime cases. I know that um, uh, the Scottish Badgers have said that they work positively with the police, but however, 
there have been a significant number of incidents. I think 80 were reported during that time frame and that they're not clear always why um, things have not been taken forward. And I think it's helpful to know that and RSPB have also highlighted that. So um, I'm wondering if you can comment on that. It, it, it's, it's, I'm not saying this is the case, but I would appreciate any comment. Communications, how do they work? Wildlife and Environmental Crime Unit a liaise and work very closely with a partner agencies, a with Police Scotland, with SSPCA, a on occasion with RSPB and a Scottish Badgers. A we would meet with them and a a when, a when that is appropriate. A and a in this in this particular year, a no no a a offences relating to badgers. But the, the, sorry, the, the report does not show the specific numbers of cases uh, reported to COPFS due to the suppression, the suppression of data in the, in the report. Um, but I've not been aware of any um, particular issue taken with any cases reported to uh, COPFS by Scottish Badgers. Certainly in the past, when there have been concerns, uh, there's been an approach to uh, the team and we've met with them and had a useful discussion with them. Uh, and, and certainly that liaison extends to, to Police Scotland uh, as well. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware if there's a particular um, issue that you're, you're seeking to address. Well, I've, I've very specifically addressed it. I've said that Scottish Badgers has a concern that there were 80 incidents and they're not aware of, of the, um, the reasons for not taking forward to prosecution. And I appreciate that taking forward to prosecution is a challenge, but, but the point I'm making is, is that, um, and perhaps um, you could make a commitment today or consider making a commitment that um, you would check with those groups who are NGOs and others that you do work with and indeed members of the public who might report a crime to ensure that <clears throat> the response to their reporting of incidents is followed through. Um, the, the, the COPFS can only um, consider prosecution when a matter is reported to COPFS. So there may well have been 80 incidents notified uh, to Scottish Badgers in various ways, but that does not mean that COPFS has received 80 reports in relation to Badger crime. Uh, every report that is received by COPFS in relation to uh, wildlife crime and uh, in, indeed any offence um, is, is considered carefully and um, we, we consider whether there's sufficient evidence and whether it's in the public interest to raise a prosecution or to take alternative action. Um, so sorry, that's not what I'm saying. I'm sorry if I'm not being clear. <clears throat> what I'm saying is simply that two organisations have highlighted to the committee that they're not necessarily always getting the feedback on the incidents they report. I'm not in any way criticising whether they go forward to prosecution. I'm simply saying, could you kindly look at that with the groups that you're working with for the future. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that we would be more than happy to have those discussions, uh, but the total number <clears> of reports we received of all crime was 94. So if they're aware of 80 cases, they may well be cases that Police Scotland uh, and others are, are investigating, but those reports have not made it to Crown Office. If we don't know about it, we can't comment, and that we would not be able to tell the uh, partner agency anything about it because it's not known to us. If they have uh, specific concerns about a specific matter that has been reported to Crown Office, uh, then my team will be more than happy to discuss uh, the particulars of that with them. I appreciate that. That wasn't the point. It was um, reporting to the police. Yes. So, I just don't... I want to get a, a commitment, please. Yeah, yeah so, uh, so I, that, that my point I was going to make there is that I think that there's a real distinction between incidents and crimes. Absolutely. So, so in relation to incidents, um, you know, we have good working relations with Scottish Badgers. Um, I meet with um, with them personally a couple of times a year to iron out issues like this where if there is poor communication or the feel that our response to crimes or incidents that have been reported to us that I can address them from a strategic level and then kind of feed that out across the country so um, you know that's something I'll personally take up with them as I say I, I think the last meeting I had with them was probably only six or seven weeks ago but perhaps a little longer now um, and, and that certainly wasn't a number that I recognised that was being raised to me in terms of that lack of feedback um, but if, if that's a criticism that's uh, something I'll, I'll, I'll catch up with Thank them around. You. Angus MacDonald wants to come in on the subject of badgers. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Since we're um, discussing badgers at, at this point in the session, um, I know that Mike Flynn mentioned 
um, them earlier on, and we, we know that there were six offences uh, relating to badger persecution recorded in 2016-17, compared to seven in 2015-16, and four of these were in relation to damage to a badger set. Now, um, in statistics for numbers of wildlife cases received by COPFS in the report, information on badgers is absent with the explanation that it's a data suppressed. And so can you explain what uh, data suppressed means and, and how many out of the six offences relating to badger persecution recorded by Police Scotland in 2016-17 were referred to the Procurator Fiscal? Perhaps I have to get back to you on in terms of the, 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 the finer detail of that, um, unless you're over yourself. Uh, page 82 of the report, uh, the first paragraph explains COPFS policy as regards uh, data protection and explains why in some places in the report there has been suppression of data in line with um, our data protection responsibilities. So we're, we're not in a position to confirm uh, the exact number uh, because in some cases the um, number is fewer than five, for example, as explained in that paragraph. Fewer than five? Is it, was it? Yes. The, where there's, it says uh, where the number of cases is fewer than five, these figures have been replaced with an asterisk. In some cases, it may have been necessary to apply a further suppression to a figure equal to or higher than five to prevent other suppressed data being deduced through subtraction. And this applies to all data being published by COPFS. Okay. Um, obviously, according to our briefing, there were six offences relating to badger persecution in 2016-17. The, the report mentions that a, a five-year incident analysis of badger persecution was produced for the National Wildlife Crime Unit. So, c can you provide any information on, on what this analysis showed and, and what influence it has had? So that work I, I talked about earlier on with the National Wildlife Crime Unit, not just in relation to badger persecution, but right across the whole wildlife crime arena, the, 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 the analytical products produced by them are really helpful for us in terms of identifying either problem areas, um, problem uh, trends in different areas, you know, new um, new tactics or new um, you know techniques, I guess, or, or modus operandi used by the, the, those perpetrators. So. The, um, it, and this is something that's work in progress, it continues all the time, so very useful documents in terms of us identifying where we might have issues and then looking at plans around about how we tackle that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Fig Carson. Uh, and, and on occasion, some uh, crimes are not being recorded, even if there is enough evidence uh, to, to prosecute, um, but there's a lack of public interest. Um, and this is true in, in some cases where there was three cases of uh, Bat persecution, but because there was a lack of intent of recklessness, uh, they, they weren't taken forward. Um, so, do we need uh, recognition that there should be more data sharing, uh, and to make sure that the reports fit for purpose, uh, and then we address what could be seen as under-reporting of offences rather than crimes, because we're not actually getting a true picture. I think that's a quite specific point in relation to uh, the dis disturbance of bat roosts. Uh, um, and I think that the, the legislation is quite unhelpful, I guess, from a, a, an investigator's point of view and, I guess, from a, a, a Crown Office point of view as well, in that the um, Act details right throughout it about the willful act aspect of um, the, the rest of the Act, but in relation to disturbance, that the, the willful part is missing. But from a crime recording point of view, that mens rea or criminal intent for us to, in order for us to record a crime, there needs to be some level of evidence of that. Um, and in those cases, I met, as I said earlier on there, with, um, I, I, I forget the name of the, the, the individual from um, the um, Scottish Bats, I forgot, sorry, a bit, a bigger part, I forget the, the, the full name of the organisation. And we've talked through this very recently, actually, about how we can make representation to the Scottish Crime Recording Board so that we do have more accurate recording around about it. I guess the issue is that what you have are potentially you know, innocent members of the public who are going about their business, no willful or, or criminal intent, 
disturbing a bat roost and ultimately ending up with a crime recorded against their name, which doesn't seem like that's a, a proportionate either. So it's trying to get a balance somewhere along there so that actually we're able to, you know, actually record um, th those instances, but also uh, not criminalise people for, for a completely, uh, you know, innocent act, if, I guess. Now, that's not to say that there aren't instances where there is criminal intent, and it's really important that we investigate so that we can differentiate between the two. But certainly some of the cases that have been raised recently, um, it's really, really difficult to, to identify that there is any criminal, criminal intent there. So we recognise it as an issue. Um, I think it's probably an issue for us to take forward in terms of a tweak to the legislation, because in terms of all crime, that, that, you know, that, that generally speaking, has to be that criminal intent. So, so, so is there a, and this is for the whole panel, is there a recognition then that we shouldn't just be recording crimes to get a true reflection on what's happening out there, we actually need to have a better way and a more transparent way of recording offences? Because an offence, whether it's intended or not, it's still an offence. If someone disturbs a, bas, a bat roost or disturbs a badger, it's still an offence. It may not be a crime. So do we actually need more uh, sharing of data between stakeholders to, to identify where there's actually an offence being committed? Um, my own view is that I don't think, I think there's a specific issue with that legislation that causes that, that anomaly. I think across the board, and, and the fact that we record incidents where there's not necessarily crimes have, taken, you know, have occurred, where we have carried out investigation because a suspected crime has occurred, I think, you know, it's difficult for me to see actually how we can be more transparent around about how we are gathering information in relation to, to, to wildlife crime and, um, and reporting it. I think that, that bat issue is a, a bit of an anomaly. An anomaly. Okay. It's an issue that um, the, my, my team and, and uh, Police Scotland have discussed and there, there does seem to the particular um, regulation 391D, uh, I, I can't comment on the, the intention behind the, the drafting of the, the legislation, but certainly it's quite stark that there's no mention of the offence being deliberate or reckless when, there are, when there's mention of that in the previous provisions. Uh, so it does seem that there, it's, it's potentially um, intended to be uh, crafted in that, in that way. Um, and yes, we certainly had discussion about the fact that, that while, while um, there may not be an intent it does appear that a, a crime has been committed on, on the face of, of the facts, and um, that probably qualifies for recording. Okay. Stuart Stevenson, you still got a question on this theme? Uh, yes, yes, I do. Um, I'll also say the rule of five and is an office of national statistics restriction. All personal references below five and right across the board are not used. And all that uh, directed. Yeah, um, that's just an observation. The, my real question was just a very, very brief one, whether we could be pointed at any academic research on deterrence, uh, because I think uh, it's generally thought by me, if by no one else, that deterrence is about being caught, not about the, uh, the uh, sentence thereafter. And I wondered if there was anywhere that we could get any sense of, of whether that thing that I've picked up at some point in my life is correct, incorrect, or it's something else altogether. Anybody able to help? I, I think as a starting point, you know, uh, we're keen, anything that can assist us in the way that we tackle wildlife crime, you know, get a better understanding of individuals that are involved in wildlife crime, then we would, we would welcome that. And if there's something from an academic point of view can assist, then, then, then we'll take that on board. What I would say is that we're talking about wide ranging, um, you know, different types of crime, mm, different species, mm, different mm. areas of the country, um, and very few numbers. So actually to, to get any sort of meaningful, I guess, feedback, uh, and, and of those numbers, you know, not many people um, caught, I guess. So to try and get any sort of meaningful um, data set for that, I think would be a challenge, but more than willing to take that on board if that's, um, if that's something that well, you're able to point us in the direction of someone that would be willing to undertake that for us. Right, um, I would like to move on to the issue, which probably um, le leads quite well on from the, the, the difficulties around uh, prosecution about video surveillance. Um, well recorded issues around this. Um, can you summarise any developments that have been made in the area of the admissibility of covert video surveillance since the, the, the particular case that we had? where it was uh, not admitted into evidence. 
I'm not aware of any particular developments in the law following those cases. Okay. Um, because I'll, I'll point, uh, pick up on RSPB Scotland. Um, they, were say, they have said that they thought that the decision about admissibility of video footage placed more emphasis on the perceived irregularity in obtaining evidence than on the actual criminal offence. Uh, how would you respond to that? So, so from a, an investigator's point of view, um, we, we do have video evidence regularly brought to, brought to us, and it's something that we share with Crown, and there's not quite often discussions around about the admissibility of that evidence. I think it's a much wider issue around about human rights and the legislation that, that, um, <coughs> uh, that controls the deployment of covert tactics in any investigation, um, really quite tight legislation that um, requires, you know, I think it's been discussed at this committee before, the threshold required in terms of proportionality and necessity around about the deployment of um, covert video recording, given the intrusive nature of it. So from a police point of view, in terms of ourselves deploying um, covert video recording in an intrusive nature, um, I think my experience over the years in terms of wildlife crime is that we've never met that threshold in terms of the um, serious crime aspect um, but also in terms of that proportionality. Um, as I say, often the video footage that comes to us comes from other organisations who have recorded it, and quite often then the focus is the intent through which that footage was recorded. So uh, if it's recorded for the purposes of um, monitoring or, or assessing behaviour innocently, I guess, in a, in a wildlife environment, then it would be for the court to decide whether or not that would be admissible. Um, but clearly the, the focused deployment of... Um, video recording equipment experience has kind of shown that, that that's uh, more often than not been inadmissible. So there was uh, the, the post to review um, and the, uh, I guess I want to ask you, the recommendations around admissibility and enabling the admi admissibility of video evidence. I mean, I guess that comes back to my first question about if there have been any developments in, or, or indeed any guidance for, for people wanting to assist you all in uh, identifying wildlife crime around you know what what is admissible and, and what isn't and and you know well well-meaning people like RSPB who want to flag up instances of wildlife crime in order to help your investigation and to bring uh, people to prosecution. What guidance would you give them in ensuring that their video evidence is not going to be thrown out? So, you know, we work closely with um, different organisations who are involved in, um, you know, investigation of wildlife crime or support investigation of wildlife crime. And this is not a new issue. It's an issue that's been kicking about now for, for, a, for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we work closely with RSPB, SSPCA, and Mike will hopefully support me here in saying that I think that our partners are quite clear on the, the, um, the challenge around about the, the use of video recording equipment uh, on private land. Um, so, in terms of that guidance, um, you know, we do work closely. Uh, I don't, Michael, maybe come in here, but I don't think there's any ambiguity around about the challenges that exist around about video recording. Not from our point of view. I mean, I can only remember one recent case where video evidence was used, but that was at the request of the landowner um, whose um, livestock was being targeted and getting snared. Um, so, that was admissible because it was with the landowner's permission. Okay. Stuart Stevens. I just wanted to explore the potential distinction between video evidence that can be used to inform an investigation <laughs> and video evidence that can be used to to, uh, as part of a prosecution. Is that a distinction that is proper to make? In other words, although the video evidence may not have the evidential trail that makes it something that can be relied on prosecution, is it something that the investigator can use to establish um, the questions that the investigator may therefore be asking in trying to get evidence? Is, is that a proper distinction that I'm making? Yeah, I think so. So, uh, you know, any video evidence, whether it's admissible or not, would be used as intelligence in an investigation. Yeah. So any information that comes from that, um, again, though, we, we, you know, we would have to be really careful around about the provenance of that, that video evidence mm -hmm. and then the, the um, investigative work that follows directly from that. 
Um, but certainly, as I say, any, any evidence that's shared with us, we take that on board. There'll be discussions with Crown around about the admissibility of it, but it is, um, yeah, always intelligence. I would agree with that a lot. Of Quite a few of the cases we get now. The first one was the back case in a pub in Aberdeen where we were given CCTV of the guy hitting the bat with a pool cue. Now, the, the video was not used as evidence, but we found the bat uh, witnesses, so there was all the corroboration there that kicked off. And there's quite a few in the, the puppy trade. It's uh, emanating from um, videos on Facebook. And exactly as David says, that starts off the investigation, doesn't conclude it, but it, it gives you the information to work on. It's probably more of a, sort of a step yes. to, to more uh, robust evidence being collected rather than the, sort of the... Uh, the smoking gun itself. If, if, yeah, OK, I understand that. Right, I'm going to move on to questions from Mark Ruskell. Um, I'd like to move to a topic that you'll be aware was described by Donald Dewar as Scotland's shame, and that's the persecution of birds of prey. Um, in this uh, report, which obviously relates to uh, previous year, 1617, uh, the Cabinet Secretary does underline um, the point that this probably doesn't capture the extent of raptor persecution uh, in Scotland, given particularly what we know about the satellite tagging uh, work that's been done. Um, so I wanted to ask you really, and perhaps if, if each member of the panel could, could answer this, although I appreciate that you know, you, you'll answer it in the way that's most appropriate to your, um, to your duties and responsibilities, but can I ask you about what you see as the, the top challenge around prevention, detection, and prosecution of crimes involving birds of prey, and what are you, what are you doing to ensure uh, greater success? Perhaps, could I just start perhaps with Mike Flynn and then work across the panel on this? <coughs> um, <coughs> probably the same as uh, Police Scotland. We, we can only respond to uh, information that's received. Now, you've seen the amount of birds that the scientists have said are poisoned. Now, unless they can prove it was an inadvertent poison, it's been legally laid, like a, a agricultural thing, then you've got an offence here, but it's actually detecting who, who was the person responsible. So, greater public awareness. But the amount of people that are calling on wildlife crime to ourselves and the police is, I would say, higher than it's ever been, um, because it is quite well known um, that there are concerns out there. I think the difficulty is that already alluded to, which is that these offences occur uh, in places where they're not necessarily observed in remote areas, that sort of thing. And it's the gaining and gathering of that evidence that is a problem. Uh, as Mike's just mentioned, you can find that you've got raptors that have been poisoned, but were they poisoned where they were found or potentially many, many miles away? Uh, and all those things are challenges to us, and we will do whatever we can, working with partners to, to get sufficient evidence, and in all cases where it's possible to do so, where there's sufficient evidence uh, we will take proceedings because that's what we do. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we've, we've stated before that we're, we're committed to tackling wildlife crime and in particular raptor persecution. It's a matter that we take very seriously and uh, we've stated um, to this committee before and in correspondence that uh, there's a very strong presumption in favour of prosecution um, in, in cases reported to us uh, where there's sufficient admissible evidence and it's in the public interest um, to raise a prosecution and uh, where we can, we will. Yeah, so, so I chair the um, Raptor Priority Group, so that, that group working with um, a whole host of different partners around the table, quite a challenging partnership environment, I think it's fair to say. Uh, probably one of the most challenging partnership environments certainly I've worked in from a policing point of view in that you have two sides of a table, I guess, who are at completely um, you know, different ends of the, the spectrum in terms of their, their values, I guess, around about you know, uh, conservationists and those involved in the, the, the game industry, I, I guess, where um, you know, our focus and, and in terms of everyone working together is around about that whole prevention, enforcement, intelligence side of things. So whether that's initiatives to gather intelligence, whether it's initiatives uh, around about prevention, then I, I, you know, I, I sit at that table with feeling I have the full support in, in pursuit of the, whole, the, 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 um, the crime reduction, prevention, investigation aspect of things. So yeah, lots of work going on, um, but as, as others have alluded to, a real challenge given the, the nature of the crime often. Okay, thanks for that. Um, 
In terms of the intelligence then and, and gathering the intelligence, when this committee last looked at the, the previous uh, wildlife crime report um, and we took evidence on this, we, we discussed the, the issue of the kind of scientific data. Um, now, I mean, this report mentions the bird of prey persecution maps. Um, we're aware that there's other forms of intelligence on, on population which can point to where persecution is most likely uh, happening. Um, can, can you describe then one year on from our last session on this, how you are now using that data, particularly in light of the work on satellite tagging, to really drill down where this illegal activity is taking place? I think it's quite clear there is illegal activity taking place. Yeah. It's quite clear from that. There's no other reason why these birds are disappearing. There's no other reason why these satellite tags are stopping working in all probability. So how are you using that data hard ecological population data to drill down and stop these criminals. Yeah. So th that data is useful in terms of intelligence. Um, and uh, as I said earlier on there, any inf intelligence or information that we could use to assess problem areas, um, you know, problem, you know, tr trends in different areas, then absolutely we take that on board and use it. I think the point you make there around about so satellite tags in terms of their reliability, I think that's improving. It hasn't always been the case that there's that strong reliability around about satellite tags. I know certainly over the last six months to a year, there have been instances where we have tags or birds that have disappeared and then um, due to issues with the tag reappeared, which is a, a, always a challenge for us. And around about that crime recording aspect of it, you know, we, we need to be absolutely certain that a crime has taken place before we can record a crime, as opposed to in all probability a crime's taken place. But that's not to say that that information isn't then used as intelligence to support further investigative work or applying for warrants to Crown or uh, any other activity that we want to undertake. So are you, in the last 12 months since police were last at this committee, what has changed in terms of the way that you are using that population data? Because we've had more emphasis, a commitment last time you came here, your predecessor came here, to use that data more in your intelligence-led policing. So what, what, is, what has changed, is it, and how does that work with your special constables and information on the ground? Because it, you know, <coughs> clear what, what you're saying is there is in many communities a wall of silence and a murder um, over this evidence. So you, you have to kind of work around that and try and use this data uh, to yeah, try and drill yeah, down. Absolutely. So what, what, what has actually changed on the ground in the last 12 months? Well, well, I, I think that the use of that data to identify, as I say, problem areas so that when we do have crimes that we know that our crimes have been committed and that data and that information is supportive of our, our investigation. Um, I think it's quite a... So to talk about species population is quite a... You know, I completely understand that, that, and I take on board the point, but... On, so on one hand, we have reports that, you know, without being a wildlife expert, say that, you know, population decline is absolutely due to persecution. But then in other cases where we know um, certain species that there are issues with them, um, um, you know, in terms of the, the areas where we're trying to reintroduce them, that actually there are wider issues, whether it be, you know, um, climate or other challenges in that area that isn't always persecution so from a from a, an investigative point of view we work with facts all you know in, in terms of trying to gather evidence intelligence is really useful to support our investigations but in terms of hard and fast facts that are actionable then quite often that information um, is just supporting intelligence as opposed to something that we can you know use to, to go and get warranty for example um, so, yeah, helpful, but not, not as black and white as, as it often presents. Okay. Is there a view from the SSPCA on, on that? I mean, in terms of, I mean, I suppose you're quite constrained in terms of what, what you can and can't do at, at present, but... Uh, I mean, a lot of the evidence that's come out from the scientific, but it wouldn't base any, um, it wouldn't kick off any investigation for us. Um, there are certain areas where we know things are going on, but so do the police and where evidence can be found and it will be reported. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I think if I, if, I sorry, if I can just add a bit there, so, so, so just to give a reassurance that when, when we have uh, satellite tag birds disappear, um, you know, that's not, not dealt with as an investigation to begin with. We will investigate that. There was a case um, three or four weeks ago um, down in the borders where Golden Eagle went missing. We deployed a, um, a team down there 
with a um, search and recovery dog, recovered the, the bird, um, and initial indications are that that bird died of um, natural causes. Mm -hmm. Now, so no crime there, but a fair amount of police activity around about trying to identify whether or not a crime has occurred. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's just to give that reassurance that, that you know, that's not a one-off. If, if, if partners come to us and say, we've got uh, a protected species that's disappeared, the tag was last registered in X, Y or Z area, then we will deploy and search with partners in that area and where appropriate engage with the landowner. Mm -hmm. When in that theme, Claudia Beamish, first of Thank all. Thank you, um, Could I just um, explore this a bit further? That um, in my own region of South Scotland, there, there's um, an area, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to name it a state, it wouldn't be appropriate, but Lead Hills and Warnlock Head area, where for the last 20 years there's been um, significant reporting of um, wildlife crime, um, which appears to be pretty intractable. Now, I wonder the degree to which um, you as a force, uh, with the help of um, SSPCA and, and, and all, the, all the partners and the public, are able to focus um, on, on these areas and to what degree you're able to deploy um, uh, your, 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 I appreciate it, limited forces to <coughs> try and crack this because it's gone on for far, far too long. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think so... It's difficult to speak about in, uh, individual cases, areas, um, mm. but I think mm. as a kind of starting point... From I'm giving it as an example. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, from a policing point of view, I've, I've, I've been a, an investigator all of my, my, my police service, um, and there is, I suppose, nothing that hurts more than uh, criticism around about the level of investigation or the efficiency of our investigations in any area of, of, of policing, if you like. So... I suppose, again, it's to give that reassurance that where we have crimes reported to us and there are opportunities, we are seeking out every opportunity we possibly can to detect those offences. Um, there are challenges, but we've, we've, we've covered them today, but I think you know, anything that we can possibly do with our partners to obtain evidence so that we can report individuals to uh, the Procurator Fiscal Service, then we are absolutely taking those, those, mm -hmm. those opportunities if we can. Thank you. I've got two questions. One, I'm interested about the reliability of these tags. I, I kind of perhaps naively assumed that they were 100% reliable. Can you just talk a little bit around that if they're not as reliable as I had assumed that they were? And also, would you like to talk a little bit about weather and climate change and the last year's particularly adverse winter weather conditions, which certainly affected farming? The beast from the east did it affect the survivability of of all wildlife? So, in terms of climate change and survivability of um, wildlife, not my my uh, bag. I'm afraid you have to ask someone else in relation to that. But um, yeah, in terms of reliability of tags, um, I think it's fair to say as technology is improving, um, the the quality of the devices that are being used are absolutely you know a million miles on from where they were years ago. Um, but there is still that um, margin of, you know, it, uh, failure, if you like, where some tags do fail, that they're, that they're, they're out in the, the extremities for long periods of time and, and they do have issues. I've read the reports around about the reliability of them, but we see um, in a kind of operational environment, if you like, where we do have these tags failing, where the, the birds fall under, you know, Without going into a lot of the details, I, I, I think it's just fair, fair to say, from an investigator's point of view, um, it's quite often difficult to hang your hat on, you know, a tag's disappear. Is it definitely persecution? Will it be in some of the occasions? I think I've, I've no doubt that that's the case, but it's trying to differentiate between tag failure and persecution. A real challenge. Okay. Right. Okay. And, uh, Mark, just to finish off this theme. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, convener. I just want to very quickly go back on um, comments around vicarious liability. And I'm just wondering, particularly with the Crown Office, um, given some of the developments that we've, you know, that we're anticipating with with land reform, we're going to have a new public register in terms of controlling interests in land. Um, will that will that have any bearing on the ability to bring forward uh, prosecutions under vicarious liability? Will it will it make it easier, effectively? It, it may well assist to identify the owner of of a, a, of a particular estate. It may it may facilitate um, 
I, I, obtaining evidence of, of that fact. Um, I, I can't comment on the detail of, of the changes. Um, I'm, I'm not cited on those. Uh, but yes, it may well it may well assist. Yeah, I mean, particularly where this extends beyond the owner to actually a controlling interest, which may not be transparent. You're not cited on that. So. I, I'm not okay. cited on the detailed well, proposal, let's sorry. Soon. Right, John Scott. Um, thank you very much, convener. Um, I want to take you to the CITES laws, if I may, please, and just ask if Police Scotland has had discussions with the Scottish Government regarding how enforcement of CITES laws may be impacted by a no-deal Brexit. Quite a topical question today. So that, that's something that we're monitoring closely. We're, we're, we're unclear at this time as to what, what the... Um, you know, what changes may come about in terms of the movement of CITES. It's something that we have on our radar, you know, once we have a clearer picture around about Brexit and what some of those controls may be, then, um, you know, we'll, I suppose, adapt our processes and, 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 and as we go. But, yes, yeah, certainly that engagement's ongoing. OK, right, a work in progress. OK, thank you very yeah. much. Okay. Um, and now, um, Angus MacDonald, fresh water pearl mussels, I believe. Yes, uh, thanks, convener. Um, we know that uh, there's been um, some good work uh, going on with regard to tackling um, the issue of uh, fresh water pearl mussel uh, extraction, um, including the Pearls in, Pearls in Peril Life Plus project, uh, which has established the Riverwatch schemes. Um, so, can you provide um, some more information on the outcomes of Operation Caesar, which investigated the, the, the routes of sale of freshwater pearl mussels, uh, and how those outcomes have been used or could be built on? I have to say, it's not a, an operation that I, I have sight on. It's something that I can, I can certainly feed back to you, though. Okay. You have heard of it, though? The, the, uh, I'm familiar with the... With, with the the, the kind of details of the operation, but not in any great depth. I wouldn't be really comfortable, um, you know, talking in, a, in any detail around about that. Um, what I would say is that any operations that we have, any initiatives that we have, that learning that you're talking about is something that we pick up as a matter of routine, shared across all of the different wildlife crime areas, so that if there are learning there's opportunities, then we make sure that we realise them across the board. But I can certainly get back to you on the, um, some of the finer detail around about okay. that operation. That'd, That'd be helpful, welcome. thanks. Um, and now on to questions around poaching and coursing. We've got Stuart Stevenson. Basically, we've covered it, Camilla. Yes. Anything else, um, Finlay? You maybe had some questions. Or are you quite satisfied? Yeah. Um, well, I think Mark was also going to ask, where does the figures for uh, hunting with dogs or fox control using dogs come into this? In relation to cruelty we're using? Uh, the, uh, crimes committed uh, involving dogs. So, where, so, sorry, I'm, I'm not quite clear on the, on, the, um, on the question. There are, in the table, there's information in regards to um, hunting with dogs or whatever. There's, there's been a, a, a marked decrease. Would that suggest the reduction uh, or the introduction of the voluntary good practice guide is actually working? Again, it's difficult to say, given, given the numbers. Um, you, you would hope that, that that has had an influence there, but um, given the, the, the low numbers that we're talking about, and you look at the fluctuations over the, the past years anyway, it's difficult to make any real assessment around about the success of that or otherwise. Okay. Right. Um, Mark Ruskell, questions for the SSPCA? Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, I mean, I wanted to, to explore then the, the relationship between, the working relationship between the SSPCA uh, and the police and how that works in practice and perhaps some of the options that, that are available uh, to government. Um, particularly, you know, we've already mentioned about special constables and their kind of enhanced role within one area of Scotland. Um, perhaps if I could get a view then from the SSPCA and, and Police Scotland about how that relationship works in practice and how perhaps that differs between the treatment of wildlife crime and the treatment of crimes where an animal is under the control of man under the legislation. Um, I think it's fair to say that every day in life our inspectors work with members of Police Scotland. Um, there have been a few occasions, uh, particularly with wildlife incidents, that we don't know anything about until after the event. Uh, and I'm not saying that we should. If the police are dealing with it, then the police are dealing with it. But 
I know that the Cabinet Secretary declined to give us powers under the Wildlife and Countryside Act, but we can still deal where a live animal or bird is concerned. And we, as I say, we work constantly with the police. We couldn't actually do a lot of your job without the assistance from Police Scotland. So it, in, the, in general, it, the cooperation between is very good. Uh, there are certain areas where, it, like anything else, it could be better. Mm -hmm. A view from the police? Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think, you know, we work with a lot of partners uh, across wildlife crime. Um, you know, given the numbers of crimes that we actually have reported to us and the, the, um, the way that those crimes are spread across the country, you know, we don't always have officers dealing with them who have dealt with lots and lots of wildlife crime before. So quite often I talk, I talked earlier on there about our wildlife crime liaison officers within the divisions providing that support. Uh, do we always get it right in terms of engaging with partners? Not always, but I think we've got a good working relationship so that if we have issues, uh, we have key individuals who can pick up the phone to each other and if there are any issues, we're, we're able to iron mm -hmm. them out. But no, we, we welcome the support from the SSPCA, particularly around about a lot of the intelligence information that provide, um, much wider actually than just wildlife crime uh, across uh, serious and organised crime as well. Mm -hmm. uh, a really valued partner in respect to that. So um, I think it's like all different, you know, it's like all partnership working, it's, a, it's a, an evolving thing and, you know, it's not always plain sailing, but I think it, as long as we've got a kind of shared um, objective in terms of tackling or investigating wildlife crime, then I think we we'll always find our way. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair to, fair to make a comment there. Um, we've got some of our special investigations working with intervention units and that is having some fantastic successes on animal welfare, but also some um, really good successes for Police Scotland and that's over a range of things. Um, and we're working very closely with Police Scotland and like known badger um, baiters and uh, diggers. So, in, as I say, in many areas, it works very, very well. Mm -hmm. I mean, would Police Scotland have any concerns if the powers of the SSPCA were extended in relation to wildlife crime? Would that create any practical issues on, on the ground or? Well, so, so I think in our submission, um, probably going back, is it been about 18 months, two years ago now, we're quite clear on our view that the powers sat with Police Scotland in terms of the investigation of crime and the SSPCA, um, you know, a key partner in, in, in support of that. And, and, and I don't think that that position has changed from our perspective just now. I'd have to see what, your, what, what those proposals and suggestions would mm -hmm. be if they were any different from what was looked at previously. Um, but I take you back to what I said five minutes ago there, that I think as long as we've got that kind of um, shared objective around about investigation and prevention, then you know, I think we'll, you know, it's a good working relationship. Mm -hmm. Can I ask then the SSPCA's view? I mean, are, are you actively seeking more powers at the moment? And if in your discussions that you've had with government, what, if there is a concern, what is it and what are you able to address or otherwise? To be honest with you, um, we were informed the same as anybody else when the minister made her statement. We never got a, a real clear definition of what if there was any issue, what that was. Um, the original suggestion was made by Peter Peacock, MSP, during the Wayne Bill, and we accepted that and we made the offer. And that offer still stands. We did write to the Cabinet Secretary after the announcement was made and says, if in five years' time reviews show that you want to review it, then our offer would still be on the table. Um, but regardless of that, back to what David said is, my inspectors from Shetland and Shranrar are there to assist the police with the current setup in the legislation every day of the year. Mm -hmm. In terms of how your powers are, are, are governed, uh, the governance issues around that, I mean, you, you obviously have a substantial powers in relation to animal welfare more generally, particularly with domestic animals under the control of man under the law. Are there, are there issues about the modernisation of, of the governance of those powers that, that have been raised, or are there... Do you, are you fit for purpose, basically, yes. to discharge those duties and extend them? I think when you look at... you're aware of as a uh, your board and... The, the, board, the, the rules of um, disclosure, the rules of prosecution are the same whether it's domestic um, animals or wild animals. And I think I did make the argument at the time uh, regarding the police's statement that they have primacy over wildlife crime. If you take it to that extreme, the police have primacy over domestic dogs being starved, domestic dogs being kicked, it's still a crime. Um, so that was my argument. I've never understood why we can have the powers for all the domestic animals, which take up probably 95% of our work, and that includes livestock, not just um, 
dogs and cats and stuff. And yet, for what was the smallest part of our work, we weren't regarded as fit for purpose. But it, it's never really changed our intent. We didn't go in a huff when the minister said we couldn't um, get the powers. But it's not changed. We will still assist the police, and we do need the police to assist us, and we don't want that to change. So how, what, does the, what does this practically mean on the ground then in terms of the extent of your powers? So if you, if you see somebody um, hitting a horse, for example, in, a, in an enclosed paddock, but then you also see the same person uh, engaged in, in you know, hitting a wild animal or, or you know, destroying a fox or whatever in an in a inhumane way outside of that closed paddock area. What, what's, what, what would be the difference in terms of what you can and what you can't do? Because I'm not, I'm not entirely clear right, okay. what, what, I think that's what quite, the big difference is. That's quite, easy. that's quite easy. A lot of that is on the prevention side. I mean, literally, if it's a badger in a snare and the badger is alive, we can deal with it because there's a, a genuine welfare issue and we're there to relieve the suffering. Whether that became a prosecution because our purpose was to protect the welfare is different. But when you get under section 19, if we remove the badger that's been in an illegal snare and we suspect there's any other snares that could cause similar injuries, we have no right to retrieve that as evidence. We then have to withdraw from that, report it to the police and then hope that they've got the resources at that time. And again, we're talking in rural areas and you could be talking doing a half day search to try and find illegal snares where nothing's currently suffering, but potentially every snare can catch something. So that that's the main difference. If there's a live animal or bird involved, we will right. deal with it and secure the welfare of that animal and then by whatever means involve the police to try and take it further. Right. So, so how does the police then respond in, in that situation? Where... Yeah. yeah, so we'll, um, as Mike said, we'll attend. Um, it depends on the location, I suppose, demand at that time. Um, I think it's fair to say that it's part of our submission around about the consideration of extended powers. We, that very scenario, um, we, we, we submitted that we hoped that SSPCA's powers could be extended to seize evidence so that actually there would be no loss of evidence at that time. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, Michael, I'll, I'll, I'll have a, you know, my, my view of it is that we, we are um, more often than not able to attend and I'm not certainly aware of cases where there's been a loss of evidence through us but being un unable to t attend or there's been a delay. The the, the only instances I can actually think of is where we've reported it to police because we've not got the right to do anything and there hasn't been a constable available um, and there have been occasions where the police have then bounced it back to us saying, well, we're kind of telling you you're sure. going to have to do it because we don't have them there. But there have been incidents in the past where it's been, oh, that will be tasked to the wildlife officer who happens to be off for the weekend or whatever. And our concern with that is there's still potential snares there that, illegally said that could damage something. So that's actually happened? That has happened in the past, right. but it is real, to be fair. Okay. And just final question. Um, I mean, as an organisation, and, and perhaps get police view on this as well, where, where do you see where you can bring added value? Where can you make the biggest impact in terms of tackling wildlife crime? Is it badgers? Is it bats? Is it raptors? Is it fox hunting with dogs? Or, I mean, I don't... Um, okay. I mean, we've had some very good success uh, with badger related um, as opposed to um, badger act crime where it's, mm -hmm. you've got the offence and you catch them on the set. Yeah. The majority of stuff we get is bashed up dogs that further corroborative evidence shows, I mean like video films, that that dog was injured because I filmed it fighting a badger. Um, and in every one of those cases we've worked very closely with Police Scotland because some of the people um, actually, most of the people involved in that are also uh, regular clients of Police Scotland. Indeed. Um, Police Scotland, do you have a, a view on where you no, think uh, SSPCA could bring value and additional so, value? So they absolutely do bring value, um, as do many of our partners that we investigate mm. in partnership with. Um, you know, they all bring something different to the table, it has to be said. Quite often it's that um, kind of mixed resource when we're carrying out searches or we're, um, you know, yeah across all different types of wildlife crime. So I wouldn't 
to, I would pick one particular area. I think that, you know, um, as and when we are investigating a crime, depending on the circumstances, we'll call upon different partners to support us where they can. I think in, I've been involved in wildlife crime on and off for probably five or six years now, and where we've come from where we were five or six years ago in terms of that partnership working and our response to wildlife crime, um, I think we've, 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 you know, there's a massive shift in terms of the, our improvement around about. But it's like everything, you know, there's there's still room for improvement. That partnership working will continue, um, and hopefully we, we continue to, to to improve things. So what's more effective, special constables or the SSPCA, or is that the wrong question because you need them all yeah, together? Yeah, I think together, we're comparing apples and pears. To be honest with you, right. I think the SSPCA have a, a, a clear role in terms of their expertise and the function that they have, and special constables again. Um, a, d a different role altogether, and, and, and both police, you know, we talked earlier on there about, uh, uh, you know, the differentiation between wildlife crime and rural crime. Well, the, as far as a special constable is concerned, the crime's crime, and they're there as that kind of guard, watch, and patrol. Whereas the SSPCA have got quite, quite a, mm -hmm. a, a, I suppose, a narrow role in terms of yeah. uh, crime. Okay. And trusted support either way. Because people think wildlife crime, you've got your um, poison bird, you report the person, that's the case. The amount of work and investigation that has to carry on, but if you take badgers, for instance, by the time you get um, veterinary reports, pathology reports, this, um, the amount of um, items that are being seized by the police, mobile phones and stuff, that's hours and hours and hours of work. And we, we share that on quite a regular basis. And to be honest with you, I've known a lot of police constables, or mainly middle management sergeants and inspectors, who are delighted that we get involved because instead of taking a constable's time for like two shifts, you've, you've used them for an hour. We can get warrants in our own name. We have never served a warrant without the presence of the police. And it's, that's one thing we have never, ever been denied. If we've got the warrant there that's been issued by the Crown Office, the police will always assist us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. John Scott. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Convener. I just wanted to pick up on these points that Mark has been making, and um, Mike will remember. I mean, he referred to Peter Peacock in the third session of Parliament. Did you say it was the Wayne Bill uh, when that evidence wasn't um, accepted then that was brought forward by Peter then? Remarkably, I was the Deputy Convener of that committee then, and it was the same Cabinet Secretary, Rosanna Cunningham, then as now, who also looked at the situation, must be 10 years ago. So would you say that the development of special constables is, is indeed the way forward and the evidence thus far, although you're still awaiting evaluation, is indeed the way forward to further reduce wildlife and rural crime? Would you be happy with that position, the I, enhancing the status quo? I, I, th I think what, what be, you know, without seeing the evaluation and, and, and having a real full understanding of the uh, success or otherwise of that initiative, I think I, I would I'd prefer to wait to see that. But I, I think I come back to what I said earlier on there that any opportunity or any suggestions around about a better way to deploy our resources, a more effective way to, as I say, have them in the right places at the right times, then you know that, that that's what the focus should be. As I said earlier on as well, our, our resources are, are, are finite. Lots and lots of different challenges and demands placed upon us. Um, but yeah, I think we we'll wait and see what the what the, the evaluation is, and then and then take that from there. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I want to briefly ask you about drones. Um, I have a particular constituency in, interest. Um, the Ithans in my constituency, with the largest seal hole light site colony in the UK. I'm quite proud of that fact, as you can fully tell. Um, but there have been instances where drones have been disturbing the colonies, and I tend to think that the majority of people using drones, it would be an unintentional effect of what they were doing. But do you have any instances where drones have been used and you've been able to identify that they've been intentional in harm, causing harm or distress to wild animals? No cases that I'm aware of, but that's not to say that there haven't been cases. Um, and, and, and again, I, I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis. If that's reported to us and there's a suggestion of criminality, then it's something we would investigate. I think you're absolutely right that I think the, the, the use of drones is something that's just taken off, to pardon the pun, but you know, yeah. lots and lots of people are using them for, for a whole host of different reasons. Um, and I would imagine you know, the monitoring and, and uh, capturing of wildlife is, is one... You know, yeah. Probably legitimate use, but maybe people not thinking through the, the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. 
Mate, for the view, have you had to come across anything where they've been used for that very well, negative We've heard practice? of it, or we've um, not proven anything different, but it was raised at the Legislation uh, and Guidance subgroup of Paul, yeah. uh, Professor Colin Reid, and I know that's led to SNH looking into work to decide whether or not people would require a licence for certain purposes, because there have been bits that people are taking aerial photographs of birds of prey, and if you get too close to the nest, you'll disturb them, you could uh, ruin the nesting site. So I know Scottish National Heritage, it's an active thing that they're looking at at the moment. Yeah, okay. But no, no actual recorded criminality involving drones so far, but it's a case of... Yeah. Back to you. Okay. Yeah. yeah no okay. Problem. Interesting. Um, our final theme um, from John Scott on beavers. Um, thank you, uh, Kendrina. Um, uh, Police Scotland will be aware that an SSSI has been laid, um, um, preparing for beavers to become a European protected species. Um, have you considered how unlicensed interventions, including unlicensed culling, will be approached in the initial period? or indeed thereafter, uh, after the regulations come into force? Yeah, so I, I saw the news was it maybe two or three weeks ago now uh, around about that, um, and it's something that we plan to, well, it's work in progress again, we plan to sit down and just look at the, the implications of that, what the, the, the legislation will, will, will look like, and, as a, and I guess like all wildlife crime, um, you know, look to, to get a, a partnership approach to um, you know, tackling any issues that come about through that. Do you see any particular challenges around that type of enforcement that's envisaged, or an extra workload, or well, how well, do I think you see that developing? Well, I think there's challenges right across the whole wildlife crime arena, uh, and, a, and another one. You know, I, I think with with the approach we have to other types of wildlife crime. Um, I think are, are, are working well, and there's no—I can see no reason why that wouldn't replicate across to any issues with beavers. Um, but yeah, we'll just have to we'll have to see how that plays out in the fullness of time. Okay. Okay. okay thank you very much. Um, I think that's all our questions for today. I want to thank you very much for uh, spending their t your time with us and uh, giving us uh, the answers that you have. I'm going to suspend this meeting for five minutes just to allow a change in witnesses. Uh, be there.
The third item on the agenda is to hear evidence on the conservation of salmon, Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019, and I'd like to welcome to our panel Simon Dryden, the Policy Team Leader for Salmon and Recreational Fisheries. Good morning. Keith Main, Policy Manager, Salmon and Recreational Fisheries Marine Scotland. Good morning. And Dr John Armstrong, Director of Freshwater Fisheries Laboratory, Marine Scotland Science. Good morning to all. Um, I guess I, I, th I think as an opening um, question, I'd just like to ask you what the concerns were um, that were raised in the consultation uh, on the 2019 regulations, and if you can give me an idea of how they've been addressed. The um, consultation we uh, ran between October and November last year, we had this year um, 39 individuals uh, coming back with representations, which was significantly lower than, than the consultation the previous year, um, for all sorts of reasons, probably. Um, the, the concerns were, were quite balanced, actually. There, there were um, a number of people who uh, came back to us and were concerned that the um, river gradings individually were, were too low, and one or two of those were rivers who had come to us before. Um, uh, and, and we have written to people and explained that although the assessment methodology has moved on quite significantly in the 12 months since we were last here, we've made some quite significant changes. Our assessment is still the fact that uh, the rivers in question are below their conservation status, and we still feel that it's, it's not sustainable to allow people to kill and retain salmon, although fishing continues on those rivers. Um, we had almost exactly the same number of people who came to us and said, we actually think you've graded our river too highly. Um, there might be all sorts of reasons for that. One or two people had said to me in, in discussions that they were concerned that it gave a, a, an impression that good times were back and lots yeah. of salmon had come back again. Uh, we've been very clear ever since the Cabinet Secretary launched the consultation in October and throughout our messaging, and we will continue to be so, that that's not the case. The downward, there's a continuing downward trend in salmon returning to Scottish waters, um, and uh, that's quite a steady decline at the moment. The, uh, and there are all sorts of things that we're doing to try and address that, and I'm sure Simon and John will, will, will talk about that. But we're very clear that within the, the boundaries of the model, as we've, we've, we've developed it, that we believe that we can allow a, a greater number of rivers this year to fish and to retain fish, but there have to be proper management arrangements in place. Quite a few rivers have gone from what we grade three, which is mandatory catch and release, to a grade two. And we've made clear this year that a grade two, the, the sort of first line of defence is to say, keep promoting catch and release on these rivers. Uh, and indeed in grade one rivers, where we think that, that the exploitation is, is continuing to be sustainable, we always encourage people to catch and release uh, as, as much as possible. And in fact, year on year, over 90% of all the fish caught uh, are returned to the waters by anglers, which is, 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 is helpful. Um, there are then some individual cases that, that, that came in in the consultation. Um, we have endeavoured to engage with everybody, and uh, everybody who wrote, wrote to us, uh, all the 39 individuals, whether they were um, single anglers or whether they were bored or whatever, we have written to them, uh, sometimes two or three times. We've had quite an exchange of correspondence. We've uh, talked to them on the phone. We've met with one or two. We have a meeting later this week with the uh, Loch, Lam uh, Loch Lomond Angling Improvement Association, who we, we engaged with last year um, on, on a number of issues. And we're having a, a catch-up meeting with them this week. Um, the Fourth Rivers Trust next week. So it's part of an ongoing engagement to mm. say, what are your concerns on the river? But, but the, the general message was, I think, that people accepted that we had taken big steps in developing the model this year. There are still some people who think that fundamentally we've got it wrong and that adult modelling is not the right approach, but we are doing other things around that. Um, but uh, on the whole, on the whole, it was, it was kind of a split message this year. It was a little odd. And do you think, you, you mentioned that you had a, a lot less... Uh, uh, submissions this time. Do you yes. think that's part of that general acceptance that that's, that things have to be done? That you, you can enjoy you can enjoy angling, but you know you have to, to have to release the, the fish afterwards. And there's a, a general change in attitudes towards that. T to be honest, I would like to think that that's the case. Um, 
But we have to bear in mind that last year we had 192 representations. More than half of those were from the Loch Lomond Association and their members who mobilised and, and uh, had a letter writing campaign. So in, in pure numbers of people, um, we were down there. The Loch Lomond assessment this year, because of the way in which we've changed the assessment and, and recalculated egg targets, for example, means that Loch Lomond fishery uh, people can retain fish again this year. And therefore, uh, we've not had that letter writing campaign. Right, okay. We've, um, uh, you know, in, in fact, had one or two people saying, yes, thank you, we, we agree, and, and, and they step back. Um, the, I mean, it's simply a case that, 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 that people perhaps just don't want to stir the pot if, if they think that this year they're, they're not being forced to, to um, put fish back, all the fish back. They may be just wanting to keep their heads down a little bit. So there will, there will be something of that, I think. But I, I'm hoping we also get the message across better. Simon Dryden. Yes, I, I think uh, another part of the, uh, the equation is that uh, last season we successfully conducted some uh, national electrofishing. So that's sampling juveniles. And some of the criticism from anglers is that our assessment at the moment is based on adult returns and they would like to see us taking into consideration an assessment of juvenile abundance uh, in rivers. Uh, and we've made substantive steps towards that. Uh, uh, nearly 800 sites were sampled last year. And whilst that was driven by local biologists, it did, in a lot of areas, involve uh, local volunteers taking part in the process uh, and, and had a lot of coverage on uh, social media. Uh, so I'm hopeful that that's, that's been uh, a positive outcome. Uh, and we committed to uh, report the uh, output from that exercise by the end of this month. Uh, and we're on track to do that and to, to share that paper with local biologists. Okay, thank you very much. I um, move on to questions from John Scott, followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, and um, thank you, and uh, good morning, uh, gentlemen. And can I just say that the, the methodological changes between 2018-19 assessments um, appear to indicate an improvement in the status of, of, of salmon in a variety of rivers, but this is apparently not the case. And what are the practical implications of that, um, and the different method of assessment, egg requirements, rivers, things like that? Yes, we've looked um, at some additional data so that the assessment is now based um, where, where we're looking at numbers of eggs required is now based on Scottish data exclusively. Previously, we brought in data from various countries at the same latitude. And because we can now uh, target our required estimates specifically on Scottish rivers, we, we get a, a more accurate, a much narrower band of what is required. And it happens that we require few, fewer eggs than we thought we did with the previous information. So that explains the uplift then in uh, the improvement, does. I see. It does. If, if but one, there's no real change because it's just a different way of measuring it, right? That, that's correct. And if, if one uses that method retrospectively, one finds that there is a continuing decline in numbers of eggs being deposited by salmon generally. So we need to be a bit cautious here. It looks as though rivers are in better condition because of the new method, but nevertheless, there is still a downward trend in numbers of salmon. And, and just leading on from that, why do you think the number of eggs that are deposited by salmon are in decline? Do um, you have it's, a view on that? It's, it's because the numbers of salmon returning from sea are continuing to decline. And also the sizes of salmon coming back from sea uh, are decreasing. And so smaller fish have fewer eggs. So there are two factors that are contributing. I notice that the rivers in Ayrshire, to be parochial for a moment, with the notable exception of the esteemed Stincher River, um, are all at grade two or worse. Certainly people in Ayrshire believe this is some measure affected by um, fish farming and further out west and north as salmon make their route through these fish farms. And it would seem, as a farmer myself, that 
the obstacles and the, the for example sea lice um, will reduce the fertility in all probability of salmon therefore leading to a, a reducing number of eggs therefore affecting in some measure uh, the fish numbers in the river is that a proposition which uh, I'm, I'm essentially just making up as I go along, but does it does it make sense um, that this might in the, it, be affect one of the factors that be affecting the, the reducing numbers of salmon in re rivers? Mm -hmm. it, it is possible that sea lice uh, will reduce the condition of adult salmon. There's a paper recently published uh, hinting that mm -hmm. the actual degree of reduction in condition was quite small. So any impact on fecundity of, of higher levels of sea lice on returning fish would be relatively small, probably. I, I would suggest that, might I suggest that more work should be done on that, because certainly in other livestock, land-based livestock, as a farmer again, um, any of these, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, things like lice and sheep, or ticks or other animals certainly take down condition and thereby reduce fertility. And there's a lot of veterinary work around that in the mammalian um, animals. Mm -hmm. So I'm just welcome further look at that. Simon Dryden wanted to come in. Yes, I wanted to say that uh, I've been having a lot of dialogue with the the Ayrshire's, Ayrshire Rivers Trust, and and one of the uh, major issues that, that they're seeking to contend with is uh, is diffuse pollution and sedimentation from from the the farmland and they've been doing a lot of good work on uh, green bank engineering where they uh, to uh, shore up the river bank on riparian tree planting and on fencing yes. uh, and just this week i've been uh, working with them collaborating with them for a bid that they're putting into scottish natural heritage uh, to make, uh, to try and take advantage of the new biodiversity fund that was uh, launched on the 11th of February, and S and H are promoting bids of between 100 and 200,000 that need to be in by the 5th of April, uh, and I think uh, Ayrshire Rivers Trust. Well, I, not I think I know they are going to put forward a bid with our support for work that will. Uh, uh, seek to progress the already good work that they have done with those three elements, fencing, riparian tree planting and green bank engineering. Right, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning to you all. Uh, can I just start by saying that um, uh, two years ago, as those of you who were involved at the, the, that stage in, in all these issues, we'll know that there were a considerable number of very serious concerns by local groups, not just Loch Lomond. And uh, I think it's, it, it needs to be recorded um, for the official report that um, uh, these appear to be many less. And I think the granularity of the science has certainly helped with that. So I wanted to have that recorded. Um, I, I would like to ask... Um, two quick questions um, in relation to the methodology changes. Uh, two years ago, and I think last year as well, if I recall correctly, there were um, concerns about the development of the, um, of the egg um, requirements. And uh, I understand that there are now 12, sorry, 11 sites that are being um, uh, assessed um, in relation to the egg targets. And I wonder if there are plans to increase those in, in view partly of the public confidence, but also in terms of the verification of science throughout Scotland? Uh, yes. <clears throat> where, where we can put in new fish counters, as, as is the hope going forwards, that will give us opportunities to generate stock recruitment relationships, which are, are used to come up with the egg targets. So we should, as, as things roll forwards, continually increase with the accuracy of the approach. All right, thank you. And then um, in terms of the adult assess assessments, um, I understand that the updated methods um, remove the geographical component <coughs> from the process with the relationship between catch and salmon numbers being determined by month and flow conditions. 
Um, and could you explain, one of you please, where, whoever it's appropriate um, to do so, um, in more detail the benefit of removing the geographical component um, to the returning number? Because it isn't clear to me why the geographical area isn't considered along with the month and flow. Um, does this distort the overall picture or not? Can you explain to <coughs> me and the committee as lay... Yep. Well, I'm a lay person, for sure. <laughs> it's geographical area is still considered as a possible factor in right. the models. But um, it so happens, as, as more information has gone in, that it, it no longer comes out as a significant factor. Could you explain that for, for those who will be looking at the official report for reassurance? Could you explain why it's not regarded as significant? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, it's probably a statistical issue in that with few, when you have relatively few data, you can get spurious mm -hmm. factors that come out as being significant. Mm -hmm. And as you get an increase in, in the, the availability of data, you get a more realistic assessment. So um, I don't think there's, there's a, a great reason beyond it's, it's simply not... Uh, it doesn't show any, any, of, any effect that's, that's worth considering. Right. I, I'm sure that will be reassuring to people who wanted to know the answer to that. Thank you. Might I just butt in? So what you're saying is the, the, the lack of data makes the findings statistically insignificant. That, is that what you're saying in essence? Um, one can be looking at a range of factors um, such as water flow, altitude, position in the country, and how that influences um, the, uh, the efficiency or, or the, uh, the efficiency with which anglers catch fish. Um, and so what we're trying to do is to work out which of those factors are, are important ones that should be retained in an overall model. And as we've put more data into the pot, we've found that basically the geographic position no longer is an important factor. Um, which is perfectly reasonable. Um, it's not obvious why it would be easier to catch a fish in the north than the south, but it so happens that in an earlier model, which was with less data, it came out as being significant, probably because the numbers were really rather low, and it just so happened that they were a couple of high ones in the north. Mm -hmm. I expect the skill of the fishermen is likely to be much more important than anything else. If, if that varies around the country, then it will come out in the model. <laughs> Mark, Mark Ruskell. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to get my, my head around how we've got to this point. I mean, my understanding is that, you know, this framework was brought in because of potential infraction proceedings uh, in the European Union because of the conservation status of the salmon. This isn't about the status of angling associations, it's about the status of the salmon that was the original driver, and that's why we have the system in place now. But it seems very counterintuitive to me that you're proposing increasing the, the river gradings to allow the catch and kill of salmon at a time when the conservation status is declining, unfortunately, rather than improving. And to me, I mean, I, you know, it seems to fly in the face of the precautionary principle. Are you, are you not concerned that the European Union may look at this again and say, well, you know, I see you have a management framework in place, but the decisions that are being made are not precautionary and the conservation status of this species is failing. I'll start on that, please. We, uh, with, the, with the wild sector, I think it's important to say we have identified 12 uh, pressure groups, uh, sorry, 12 groups of pressures which are impacting uh, salmon. And we want to approach, uh, we want to decide to mitigate and address all of those pressures. Uh, and uh, focusing on any single one of them, such as exploitation, which is one of the 12, uh, the pressure from angling, uh, is not the panacea to uh, uh, supporting, to, to resolving the problems of wild salmon. Now, if we take angling specifically there and look at it, the anglers are catching approximately 10% of the stock. Uh, and of that 10% that they're catching, uh, they're releasing 90% on average. Uh, 
so they are killing at the moment uh, about 1% of the stock. Now, of the, uh, uh, intentionally, consciously, of the 90% they release, we estimate that 10% will, will die as a result of the angling activity, even though released before spawning. So in a grade one river where our science suggests that they're meeting the conservation limits and we, are, you know, we want to be science-led, uh, that uh, a potential 2% uh, impact on the, on the stock is reasonable, given the social, uh, especially given the social and economic benefits. So if we talk about the River Tweed, for example, you know, that is £24 million to the rural economy. And, and I'm afraid I don't know the figures uh, to split elsewhere, the Tweed is perhaps just a, a good example. Uh, so as I say, uh, uh, at the moment, we consider that, that, that on balance, taking an environmental, social and economic considerations, the impact of angling we have got right, allowing for retention in, in rivers where we assess scientifically that there is uh, sufficient stock to allow some retention. So you, you, you mentioned there um, a, a principle that's in European law, you know, a kind of test of reasonableness. Um, has there been any assessment in the last year of the impact of the decisions that were made previously to restrict the grading of rivers, whether actually a, a river that's moved from a grade one to a grade two or grade three has had any impact in terms of the socioeconomic advantages of being able to catch and kill rather than just catch and, and release. Uh, do, do, do you follow what, what I'm saying? I like, think I do. We, we, yeah. we, is, is, basically, are there fewer people fishing as a result of a river going from grade one to grade three? And is that, does that stand up in terms of your We're not sure today? at the moment, but, but uh, 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 Scottish em Enterprise have currently got a uh, three-month study underway with two consultants uh, to look at that. Uh, and and uh, uh, they are uh, looking at four areas of Scotland, and uh, yeah, they've commissioned this three-month study, right. which would, they will share the results with us. So, so, uh, when, so when you say it would be reasonable, um, for economic reasons, to allow angling on a certain river and, and catch and kill rather than catch and return, you don't have an economic basis to that argument at the moment. You might do in three months' time. We, we haven't done a study at the moment. Uh, right. No, absolutely not. Uh, Scottish uh, enterprises, as Simon says, are, are looking at some of that and some of the rivers um, in the east coast of Scotland at the moment. What we do have uh, this year, and particularly the last two years, uh, is a lot of concern from angling clubs, from uh, district salmon fishery boards, and from individuals through the, um, the consultation process that we've had. Um, last year in particular, quite a number of people uh, were very concerned that there were so many rivers which had been assessed as grade three and came to us and said this will have an impact on, on membership numbers, this will have an impact on local businesses, bed and breakfasts, caravan sites, etc. Mm -hmm. etc. And, and and all of the, the sort of um, value added that, that angling brings. Yeah. I'm just keen to um, see what the what we, the what the evidence is on that. Because I mean I I just you know parochially I live on the River Teeth. Um, it's a salmon river, it's grade one. Uh, I think that the policy on the River Teeth has been to not allow catch and kill, even though it's grade one. Yes. yes. I, I still see people angling. I still see you know, the launch of the salmon season and it being very, very successful and distilleries and other people getting involved and sponsoring it. And it all, it all looks good to me. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure, even with the voluntary restraint that's been put in place, whether that's turning people away or not, I, to be I, honest. I accept we, we don't have... Uh, a, uh, a lot of uh, data on that. We have, in addition to this Scottish Enterprise study that's starting, uh, we have launched for this season the collection of effort data. And we hope over time that that uh, may prove to show us uh, uh, trends in effort and we may be able to compare that against the grading of rivers to see whether there is there is an impact. Uh, but fundamentally, the, you know, the grading is science driven. It's not, it's not as, you, as you said at the start of your, uh, at the very beginning of your questioning, that uh, uh, this is conservation led. We are not setting the grades in relation to fisheries. We're setting the grades in relation to the conservation of salmon. Of other members, um, I think Carson wanted to ask a, a question on this theme, and then Stuart Stevenson. I'm, I'm really confused. If uh, the evidence shows that the salmon, the, the, the status of salmon in the rivers actually decreasing, 
This year we've got 43 rivers where the grade has risen and only eight falling. But you're saying that's based on scientific evidence, but you're also saying it's almost insignificant. So I can't quite marry the two up where in the past you based most of the conservation efforts in reducing the, the ability for anglers to, to catch and kill. Um, but this year, when the figures are still showing there's a reduction in salmon in the river, th those categories have gone up. So I just can't quite get my head around how previously it was the all important action that you were taking, and now uh, it doesn't seem to be quite so significant. Right, I'll start and then John may, need, may wish to come in on, on the science. Uh, essentially what we're saying is, had we used the, the latest science, our improved egg targets, in 2016 and in every subsequent year, there would have been historically more rivers in grade one and grade two category. So the result of that means that we could be criticised in previous seasons for being too precautionary. We have uh, given rivers a grade historically where they were required to catch and release, where subsequent data, better science, shows that we didn't need to do that. So we have published to the anglers where their river, or, or sorry, the number of rivers that would have been in grade one and two using the current methodology in 2016 going forward so that they can see the graph and the trend to try and explain that yes this is not about stocks getting better this is about our evaluation our assessment of the stocks getting better and that we need to be science-led so yes some rivers had to catch and release previously when actually that was too precautionary so it's so there's admittance that the, the Basing the grade of a river on catch and release was flawed. It wasn't scientifically based previously. It was the best available science previously. We've always said that. Season on season, we've said it's the best available science. And what we've said this year is that because we've been changing the methodology year on year, we are now feel in a position that, that we should freeze the methodology until the 2022 season. And during that period, we will have our current methodology peer-reviewed, something that was discussed at the last uh, uh, committee last year. And John can talk in more detail, if you like, about the progress that we're already making on that peer review. Uh, so that's, so in, in future basis, whilst the catch data will change, that is input into the model, the methodology won't. We're freezing it, so we will get like for like going forward. Kind of amazed. It's maybe worth emphasising, this is only the fourth year for which we are giving gradings and, and for which the regulations apply. As Mr Ruskell said, uh, these measures were brought in, uh, in, at least in part, in large part, because there was the threat of infraction pr uh, procedure from, from the European Union at that time. And we introduced a number of measures, so uh, spring conservation measures, where we um, extended the close time or changed the close time for a lot of rivers during which people are not allowed to take fish. Uh, was, was one of the things that we that we did at, at the time in 2015-2016. We introduced the first set of regulations here, but at that stage our modelling was fairly new and fairly uh, uh, fairly broad brush. So and in the first set of regulations for 2016 season, we assessed on the basis of fisheries districts. So there were about 100 districts, which in broad terms were defined in the original Victorian legislation from the 1860s. And each year we've refined that further. So in the second year we responded to uh, calls to, to uh, assess individual rivers. And we did that. And last year we, we uh, and indeed this year, we've, we've added more rivers to the assessment. But we've also, uh, there's been an awful lot of work um, in, in the, the scientific side of things to look at what's happening elsewhere and to refine the model and to respond to um, dialogue that we've had with fisheries trusts and boards and, and anglers and indeed with the committee to say we would like you to look at individual rivers, we would like you to focus uh, instead of using an all Scotland target for uh, egg deposition, we'd like you to home in on individual rivers and all of it is about improving the science. It doesn't necessarily mean that it was wrong last year, it just means it was the best we had available. There's a lot of work to change it this year. And in, in broad terms, from my mind, because I'm, I'm no scientist, the egg targets for the majority of rivers in Scotland have effectively halved, pretty much halved, which means that the assessment, you know, you, you, the, uh, the, the, the broad arithmetic means that 
the conservation status or the, or the, the, the requirement has changed. And that brings us to a position where we think that there is a, a, a case within the, the same model as we've had to allow for some exploitation of the fish on the river. We do it in the knowledge that the majority of anglers continue to return fish and, and more than 90% are returned. So catch and release is, is, is not just something we've imposed. It's something that exists and people understand it. And, 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 and the river managers and anglers understand the need to, to engage in that conservation. So I don't, I don't think we are... Um, I don't think we're pulling the rug out from previous science. I think we're, we're definitely saying we're responding all the time and we're making the science better. Um, as Simon says, that means that last year, arguably, we were too precautionary. We still have a precautionary model. It just has a wee bit more r room in it for some rivers and some fisheries this year. Um, I have two questions related to the 2%. I'll ask the difficult one first. Um, does 2% mortality from fishing have any effect whatsoever uh, on the number of fish that spot that that come from the eggs and return to the sea, because I can see two things: if there are fewer young fish, there's more food per fish, but there are fewer fish for the predators to predate on. So I can see one pull and one push, um, and and I just wonder if we understand whether that two percent uh, mortality is actually either statistically or causally having an effect on the numbers that then leave uh, to see after the reproductive cycle is complete. When we estimate the egg targets, uh, that takes into account all of these factors, predation and competition between fish and food availability to try and tell us how many eggs do we need to fill that system. So if we have more eggs, we, we don't get many more adults. Um, we're not quite full with the, the, the methods that are recommended by uh, NASCO and ICs. We use what's uh, called maximum sustainable yield. It's just yep. below full. MSY. Yeah. So if one is below that critical level, that filling level, then every lost adult, in principle, has an effect on what will go out. If one's over that level, then you can put as many adults in as you want, but you cannot get more smolts out of your river. So just, just to be clear then, if we're looking at grade one, we are looking at, therefore, a situation where the taking out of that 2% is not having an effect. Is that I'm getting a nodding head, so that, that's right. Really right, can I move to my other question, which is very simple. <clears throat> we if, only if, have 15 minutes left with our right. panellists, so if I, we could I be I just brief. wondered how variable the 2% is, because that's presumably the whole, whole Scotland figure. What, how far does it move either side of 2%? Given the uncertainties generally, which I think we all understand, that the, the more data we can get, the more precise we can get. I think the variability around that 2% would not be a huge concern. Thank you, Kavira. Finlay Carson. Okay, just to move on to proposals for, for looking at developing the model in the, in the future. Uh, last March, uh, you agreed to look at the possibility of gathering uh, further detail and, and data on rod effort. Has that been carried out? And, and given the sort of season we had last year, do you apply different rules because it was particularly dry and so on, and how will that affect the model in the future? Uh, and also, you've, you've talked about the juvenile assessment model. How will that play into to future uh, development of the framework in the model going forward? Okay, three questions. I think it's firstly on effort. Yes, we have. We, we've introduced uh, the recording of effort for this for this first season uh, on rod days. Uh, we've put we've sent out our topic sheet on that. We've sent out uh, put sent out and put on our website Q and A so that everybody uh, is aware of that. And we will uh, utilise the results and report back on 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 those results. Uh, and. Uh, uh, depending on the data that we get, it could be built in, into the model. Uh, but we need to see we need to see the data first. But we've begun that begun that process. Uh, now I'm going to remember question number three was about the uh, was was for John to answer no, juvenile assessment. 
Shall I take that? Yes, please. The, as we talked about the adults and working out how many eggs we think we need to fill a system, uh, the juvenile assessment takes a, another approach and has a look at the system, at the juveniles, and works out how full it is. So we have a, a different threshold then. We have the number of juveniles that we would expect to get in an area at a particular altitude and with particular land use around it. So we, we have this image of what an ideal juvenile population looks like, and we, we then collect data to see how close it is to that ideal. So once we have those data, as well as the adult data, we can put the two models together, uh, the two assessments together, and we can look at how, how much coherence there is. Uh, where we don't have coherence, we will have to have a closer look at those particular systems. But I think we're, we're getting very close now to having the juvenile assessment to go with the adult assessments. Uh, and I think, as Simon said, really over the next month, we should be in a position to, to see how well those mesh together. Okay, just that, that will obviously include uh, predation and, and whatever. Is, is there any plans or, or, or anything in the horizon with regards to predators and the river and, and maybe legislation you'll have to bring in regarding licensing of controlling predators and then th thinking about cormorants and, and, and whatever? Is there, is there any plans uh, or any issues you can see coming forward with predator control? Yes, if I take, uh, if I take piscivorous birds uh, first, we, we've uh, managed to secure uh, £750,000 of EMFF funding for research on that. Uh, and this year on the River Dee, we, for the first time, uh, uh, acoustically tagged pre-smolts with receivers in the river uh, to try and identify predation by birds uh, working jointly uh, with the River Dee. If we tag pre-smolts, and in the past it's been smolts, if we do pre-smolts, we can reduce the risk that handling and the tag itself causes mortality. Uh, in the same, what, what we've also done as well is we've just uh, launched a uh, uh, Pacificus bird uh, stomach analysis uh, project, and we have licensed four rivers, or sorry, we, Scottish Natural Heritage have licensed four rivers, the River Nith, the River Tweed, uh, the River Dee and the River Spey, and they've each been given uh, an allocation of 36 Cusanders and 36 Cormorants, uh, and we're going to have uh, two periods where uh, those, those species will be uh, killed and their stomachs will be uh, analysed to have a look at their diet. Uh, this was done in the 1990s, and uh, so we've got some results from 20-odd years ago, and we're going to compare uh, the results from 20 years ago, which were with higher numbers of birds with this lower number of birds, just to see whether the diet has changed. For example, on the tweed, in, historically, uh, quite a lot of the diet was uh, eels, and we think that, 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 that the diet has changed. By having four regionally dispersed rivers, we can look to see whether there is a, a difference in diet because the freshwater species in rivers uh, regionally throughout Scotland does differ. You tend to have a greater diversity in the south of Scotland to you do in, in the north of Scotland. Uh, once we've got the results of that stomach analysis, we've got the results of the D acoustic tagging we're doing this summer, uh, we, we hope to do two other pieces of work. Uh, one is to look at the bird count data that is supplied to SASA annually for rivers who want a license to manage birds mm -hmm. through SNH, to look at that data to see what trends it shows us. And secondly, to spend the bulk of the money in, in seasons 2020 and 21 to do experimental field, field work. What can we do to, if the evidence shows we need to, to better manage these two protected species? We want, obviously, to protect both species, but we want to get a, an appropriate balance between uh, uh, both species and, and ideally have non-lethal methods for achieving that balance. Okay. Uh, John Scott. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, uh, well, you say that the measuring process will continue until 2022. Um, how do you expect the expected introduction of beavers to impact on salmon numbers, particularly hens, salmon numbers' ability to reach uh, their spawning areas upstream? Well, that, that's one of the pressures we, we need to look at. I mentioned uh, uh, 
uh, 12 pressure groups, and, and uh, uh, beaver management is within that pressure group. Uh, uh, if resources allow, uh, uh, that we'd we have noticed that there are methods, which John may be able to talk about a bit more, where, where you can stick a pipe in beaver dams, which uh, does not uh, reduce the level of water sufficiently to upset the beavers, but nevertheless allows uh, uh, smolts and salmon to migrate through their dams effectively. Uh, and and uh, yes, that's a piece of, you know, we'll look at that research and if resources allow work with the the sector to try and uh, see if we can implement that. I'm sorry to introduce such a mundane level of practicality into discussion as esoteric as this, but if you have a salmon flat diameter, you're going to have a three or four inch diameter pipe, which will very rapidly reduce the level of an upstream dam um, if it's running constantly, and as presumed it would have to, to allow salmon to migrate through it. Otherwise, if it's only a two-inch pipe, Simon won't get up it. And, and so, how does that actually work, what you're telling me? Um, the, uh, the concept's called a beaver deceiver. The, the idea is that the, the entrance to the pipe is some distance upstream of the dam, and as it drains the water, the level goes down, but the beaver can't figure out why it's happening, so it, it, it doesn't actually... Uh, block the pipe, it tries to repair the No, you're missing, you're missing my point. Um, but, if you have a four inch quite... pipe to allow a salmon at least, I mean, it'll have to swim up through it. So you're going to have to have a four or a five inch diameter pipe. No, it's a large, a large drainage pipe. I mean, in indeed. principle, we know that indeed, salmon... Well, if that's running full bore from the water above, uh, simple hydraulics will tell you that it will empty the dam above it. Um, so how does that work? <clears throat> Six inch pipe, see, which would be the optimum size to allow a fish to swim up through it. How does that work? Yeah, it, it depends on the height of the, the entrance to the, the pipe at the, the top end above the... Ah, uh, oh the, well, the bed. of course but, it does. But, the, but this, is, this is just a concept. I, I think you're right to, to identify that there, there might be issues with beavers and upstream passage. There was a working group that uh, looked at the issue. Uh, there's not enough research at the moment to uh, determine just how porous these dams are to salmon. So the salmon will essentially have to jump out of the pipe and back into the pool. It's just maybe one possible solution, but it's, it's not been fully looked at. Matt no, Ruskell. Right. Okay. Just wonder, perhaps if I could just take the, the converse point, the point that Mr Scott makes. I mean, do you, do you see any ecological advantages to having beavers working in a catchment, um, improving and extending the range of wetlands that are, that are available um, perhaps interacting with regeneration of riparian woodland that can perhaps shade particular areas and provide uh, temperature benefits given climate change to, to salmonid species and, and the wider ecology? Or is it all bad? It's probably a, a balance, actually. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are definite benefits, certainly for some fish species, such as trout, which would very much benefit from uh, the pools behind beaver dams. But the key issue, is, as um, mentioned earlier, is how much might the dams interfere with free passage um, of the spawning fish, and that is something that is still to be established. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, food species for salmonids and, and, and other species that are higher, higher up the food chain, do you think the introduction of beavers into a catchment would, would enhance that? Or, or Very not? complicated. Um, Atlantic salmon tend to like quite fast-flowing waters. Um, trout like slower waters. Uh, trout tend to outcompete salmon. So you might have a situation that is rather good for, for trout and not so good for salmon. Probably varies enormously from situation to situation. But it's clearly a, a, an issue um, as beavers expand uh, in Scotland that, that will need to be looked at. Okay. Mark, if you'd like to carry on to your theme or question around riparian. Um, yeah, this was a, a point that I, that I raised, convener, last year, and, and it was um, in, in the development of the methodology last year, it was clear that I think in, in particular in, in relation to the, the interests of the Loch Lomond um, Angling Association that there were issues around the data collection and, and around Fintry, whether um, with your own research whether you're actually able to even identify who the owners were of the riparian land and that perhaps the, 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 it was inferred that this had perhaps had, had influenced the data in some way because you'd simply just been unable to get access to the, 
to the stretch of the river that you needed to count the eggs and everything else. So, I mean, it is a question about who owns Scotland. Um, but, I mean, uh, do you have greater certainty this year as to, you know, who owns particular stretches of, of riparian area? And have you been able to get access to, to satisfy all of the um, pressure groups and stakeholders that uh, you've been able to do the most robust science that you can on the ground? Uh, yes, I'm pleased to, to report we do, we, we are, uh, we do have greater assurance. Uh, in respect to the, to the uh, River Endrick, we approached 70 potential uh, owners of heritable rights and established mm -hmm. 15 uh, new owners. So uh, for those 15, uh, three will be sending in catch returns from now on. They gave us their historic catch returns, but mm -hmm. they will also be giving us catch returns in the future. And 12 uh, uh, were able to confirm that they are dormant fisheries. They, they don't allow fishing on the fishery. Uh, that the historic catches that, that we got from those uh, 15 new owners uh, were not significant and would not have changed the uh, River Endrick's grade. Uh, last year I said that we didn't have, uh, we didn't know who owned the heritable rights for about 21% of the river length. Uh, uh, we now assess that to be about 7% and that's in line with our, our national situation, to be honest, that, that, that uh, uh, we probably think there's about 7% of river lengths mm -hmm. uh, that, we, that we don't know uh, and we seek uh, annually to, to try and improve that uh, situation. Ideally, we would like to have an online uh, cat, salmon and, and sea trout catch repository so that proprietors mm -hmm. could put their catches in online and, and I think that will drive, if we're able to deliver that uh, data quality mm -hmm. improvements and allow us to reduce the 7% as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, final question from Finlay Carson. A simple question. Uh, March last year asked whether uh, there was any expectations of the Wild Fisheries Bill coming forward. Can I ask Simon whether there's has got any confidence that it will be brought forward in year three as uh, suggested might be the case? Uh, it, it, it is still a candidate uh, bill, is my understanding. I'm afraid I can't say any more than that. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time this morning. Um, I'm going to suspend this meeting briefly. Thank you very much.
The fourth item on our agenda today is to consider two negative instruments. The first is the Conservation of Salmon Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019. Have anyone got any comments on this? It's the salmon regulations. Anyone got any comments to make? Okay, so uh, you're agreed that you don't want to make any recommendations in relation to these regulations. We agreed? Agreed. Thank you. The second instrument is the Conservation Natural Habitats Amendment Scotland Regulations 2019. Members will recall that the committee took evidence from the Scottish Government and SNH on these regulations last week. Are there any comments in relation to these regulations? John. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I would just like to uh, let the committee know that I would intend to lodge a motion that nothing further be done under this instrument. In other words, I object to this instrument being laid in the first place, um, and I don't, and I wish to pursue that. Um, I don't think the case has been made for the reintroduction of beavers, and certainly the harm they will do is becoming more and more apparent. So I would like to lodge a motion to annul. Okay. Is anyone else get any comments, Stuart? Um, Obviously, if uh, our colleague uh, lodges a member, we'll have a discussion on that at the appropriate time. Um, but, but, but of course, this is not a, uh, a motion that's uh, a measure that's anything to do with the reintroduction of beavers whatsoever. It is about managing the reintroduction that has taken place. Um, and, I, and I think uh, uh, when I look at the briefing note that we have, uh, I can see a long list of things that will not... Uh, have any impact, and a few that will. And the few that will, uh, removing all the dams, destroying lodges, chamber barrows, trapping and relocating beavers, and lethal control, are all in fact things that are covered um, by existing uh, cruelty to wildlife legislation. So I suspect, and we'll have the debate in due course, uh, convener, uh, that, uh, that when, we, when we look at the effect of this, we will see it is simply systematising um, the, 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 the situation that it exists at the moment. I mean, you cannot go and exercise lethal control uh, haphazardly and randomly and cruelly on a beaver right now without this. Um, and this merely creates a, a framework within which lethal control can be operated um, as it is at the moment. But uh, so, so therefore I'm less certain than John Scott uh, that, that I would wish to support him uh, on the proposal that he's intended to bring forward. Okay. Any other comments, Mark? Um, I, I mean, I'm disappointed, convener, to hear that there will be an, an, an attempt um, to try and stop this um, statutory instrument becoming law. Um, you know, we've, wa we've waited three years um, for the protection of beavers to come in. And I think during that time, uh, we've seen, you know, disastrous uh, attempts to try and uh, manage beaver populations. We've seen the shooting of pregnant animals uh, and kits. Um, and, you know, there's been some very serious welfare issues connected with that. And we've seen a very strong lobby to try and, pre try and prevent this protection. Um, being brought in, and that's delayed things even further. So I, I wouldn't want to see this delayed even further, particularly because given at the moment we're in the middle of the kit dependency season, and I'm sure there are there are interests out there, um, you know, shooting and, and, and killing animals um, as we speak. Um, what what I, I would welcome is the clarification that the committee's had from SNH um, in the last couple of days around the transparency of the proposed licensing regime because quite frankly, at the moment, we've just got a, a free-for-all. And uh, you know, I welcome some of the, the data that will be put forward um, based on local authority area, the kind of activities that will be permitted, because I do think this licensing regime you know, can't just be a free-for-all. It has to be you know, well understood um, and well controlled, uh, and anybody that breaches this regime will be committing a, a wildlife crime. The one, the one point I would add to this, um, response is that I think that the data needs to be available on a quarterly basis because there is a concern from stakeholders that we're going to see highly inappropriate lethal control uh, continue 
uh, particularly during the, the kit dependency season. And I think if the data which uh, SNH have committed to, to provide on this was available on a quarterly basis, we would be able to assess whether that there is in fact a closed season that is in operation, which is in the best interests of, of animal welfare. And I, I think that's the missing bit that I would, that I would like to see. Um, so I mean, I, I, would, I would suggest it as a way to get greater clarity from SNH on that. Um, you know, I'd, I'd take that into consideration when we okay. when we come to a final debate and uh, what will hopefully be a, a successful vote on on the introduction of this protection. Okay. Well, thank you for, uh, to all of you for your comments on this. It, it, this obviously means that we'll need to consider our cons uh, con continue our consideration of of this instrument at a future meeting. So we won't. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Pauline. <laughs> and that concludes the committee's business in public today. Uh, it's the next meeting on the 19th of March. The committee will hear from the Scottish Land Commission on its current work programme. And we're now going to move into private session. And I ask that the public gallery be cleared. <laughs> <laughs>